Okay, let me know if um, if there's something wrong with the connection. So um, I hope that um, this sort of new approach, there's nothing too new, but there, this new approach to thermodynamics is not, um, not too vague or anything. Um, it is for sure, I mean, at least for me, it's, it's more satisfying. And you'll see uh, maybe why in a second. Today we're going to get into a little bit more detail. Um, and we're going to define, hopefully, if we have time, the uh, thermodynamic potentials. And you'll see that the, the greatest difficulty in thermodynamics, classical thermodynamics, is that we have so many thermodynamic potentials like, en like um, enthalpy, Gibbs energy, and Helmholtz free energy, and this and that, and you really never realize why they're introduced. And uh, with, with the postulational approach, you'll, you'll see that it's, it's straightforward. And um, I really like to go back to the composite isolated system because this is the basic problem of um, thermostatics. Um, we, we have a completely isolated system and we devise a way of making it a composite system. So we have an internal constraint that divides these two subsystems, okay? So think of this as, a, as a, an isolated closed piston with an intern, um, container with an internal piston that you can move around left to right. But you can also think of this as like having an isolated system with a, say, a hot and a cold uh, subsystem with a adiabatic wall, okay? Now, you can manipulate this wall um, as you want. You can make things colder or hotter, uh, or you can move around the piston, as I said, um, and you constrain, essentially, your system um, on a manifold, right? Um, we have drawn this manifold here, okay? <clears throat> we know that we are in this space here, U, uh, S, and N, and you can move around up and down this, this surface, right? But the question is, what happens if I actually release the, mat, the, the constraint, okay? And I really let the system do its own thing, essentially, evolve spontaneously uh, towards some presumably equilibrium point. Our fundamental question is, um, for example, if I have a hot, subpart here in a, in a cold system here, I remove the adiabatic constraint, will the hot side become hotter and the cold become colder, for example, uh, for a given internal energy that doesn't change? Now, of course, we know <clears throat> from observation that this is not true. The opposite will be true, okay? That the hot will become cold and the cold will become hot until the temperatures will essentially equilibrate and, and uh, everything will become more boring in some sense. Same thing happens with a piston. The piston will spontaneously move so that the pressures, okay, will equilibrate, okay? Um, sometimes, uh, you know, th this question has more implications that you may think. In fact, it's one of the really biggest questions in science, because it underlines a fundamental fact that processes in, in nature tend to evolve, and by evolve I mean in infinite time, okay, but uh, at least in thermodynamics, towards a particular direction, okay? Uh, sometimes that direction is called the arrow of time, okay? Uh, it, exactly like um, uh, ice cubes tend to melt, but they never tend to form back, okay, as ice cube from um, uh, molten water, okay? <clears throat> now, you may think uh, this is obvious, but it's, it's, it's really um, one of the most, you know, fundamental questions in science that has really taken uh, all of the scientific community's um, interest, uh, including, for example, uh, cosmologists, okay? Um, there is, as you know, the, in the universe, there is an evolution. The universe tends to, to, be, to be expanding, in fact, accelerating. Um, 
And again, it's being, it's evolving spontaneously towards some equilibrium point, starting from an initial point, which we call conventionally the Big Bang. Um, and the idea here is, how can we describe this situation mathematically, okay? How, is there a theory that I can sort of devise? And of course, the theory um, exists. And in fact, there is more than one interpretation. Uh, this is the sort of a postulational approach. Then we have the classical approach of the 18th century. We also have the statistical mechanics approach um, that we're not going to, 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 to look at other than going back to that nice internet, internet site. So the idea here is, well, how do I describe the, the final equilibrium point? And this is where postulate two comes and the introduction of, as we said, of entropy, okay? Now we're introducing entropy here without really saying what it is, okay? Um, but there is a function entropy. We're not even saying at this point that, that whether it's extensive <coughs> itself, but it is a function of the extensive parameters U, V, and N, okay? It's defined everywhere in all equilibrium states, um, in all constrained equilibrium states, but it has this fundamental property, okay? <clears throat> that the values of U, V, and N, okay? Uh, that are assumed by the, these extensive parameters, when the internal constraint, the piston, is released or removed, okay, are the values that maximize the entropy over all the possible manifold of constrained equilibrium states, okay? And that is uh, the answer ex to, 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 to the fundamental question. So it's, it's answered in the form of an extremum principle, okay? Um, so this means that if I have this function here, I can write it down. This is obviously a formal, um, uh, definition, but if I am able for a particular system, for example, again, a particular system that you know is a system of a perfect gas, okay, um, that has known equations of state, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about equations of state later, but if I can specialize this and write it down uh, for that particular uh, thermodynamic system, then the problem is completely solved. The problem of finding the equilibrium point, because all I have to do is find the maximum of this equation, which is called the fundamental, the fundamental equation. Okay. Let me state the other um, the other postulates. I'm just repeating what I saw the other day. Um, this is also very important because it really fixes, it really uh, defines the basic properties of entropy in a mathematical sense. The, the basic um, property is that it is an extensive uh, function. So it is additive over constituent subsystems, okay? Again, you'll see how important this is later on, okay? It is a homogeneous first order function, okay, which is defined, which is defined here. Okay. Um, it is also a well-behaved function in the sense that it is continuous, okay, differentiable, and and this is again important, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why it is in a second, a monotonically increasing function of the internal energy. Okay, so when you supply more internal energy to the system, entropy tends to increase, okay? Again, pretty mysterious. Why should it increase? What's the meaning of it? We'll tell, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll resort to the interpretation of statistical mechanics and um, to the fact that entropy, in effect, is a measure of the number, essentially, of <clears throat> configurations, energetic configurations, that um, your system uh, can achieve, okay? So if you give essentially more energy to it, these sort of huge number of packets of energy, think of them as being a quanta of energy, can be distributed in more ways, okay, among um, atoms. 
And that, in some sense, is uh, because entropy is a measure of how many ways you can distribute energy. It uh, really tells us that uh, entropy is actually increasing. So that's why <clears throat> entropy is essentially connected uh, to heat, of course. Okay. Um, the fact that postulate two uh, is an effect means essentially that we can invert the fundamental equation, this fundamental equation, into this fundamental equation, which is an energy or internal energy-based fundamental equation, nothing special, we can invert it. Uh, so in effect, because we can invert it, we can reformulate the postulate, uh, the extreme in principle that we saw before, instead of a maximum, in terms of a maximum entropy, also in terms of a minimum internal energy principle, which is really more familiar when you're talking about mechanical systems, right? Uh, if you let a mechanical system evolve, this will evolve essentially towards <clears throat> a minimum potential energy okay? uh, configuration. Um, so this is, at this point, your fundamental equation, um, let's say, portrayed okay, as a surface. Okay, this is the manifold of constrained equilibrium system. It's, again, any sort of quasi-static uh, transformation can be drawn okay, in this, uh, on this manifold. So again, if we take our system, we take the piston, we move it, and fix it in infinite positions, we're just, what we're doing is we're moving around, okay? In this, on this particular surface, okay? But the more important question is, what happens if I release the internal constraint? And this is where we saw this diagram here, okay? Now, remember, we go back to the isolated composite system. So a system that is completely closed, uh, and isolated energetically, but it's composite. So it has essentially two subsystems. I let go of the internal constraint, the equilibrium state that is naturally achieved is that, is that the maximizes, is the one that maximizes the, the entropy, okay? So because the system is isolated, we're really moving on a U equals constant, uh, surface, okay, um, which is this surface here, okay. Uh, this is u, so u equals constant, and this is the surface here. So you, we're moving really on an intersection of the fundamental equation with this plane. And what uh, this, the, the extremum principle uh, tells us, the postulate, the second postulate tells us that the equilibrium point that is naturally achieved is this one. Okay, maximum of entropy. Okay, you can now, because it's invertible, <clears throat> you can now reformulate it for an isentropic composite system. So essentially, which is a little bit more kind of a mysterious uh, thing to keep the entropy constant in the system. But still, um, suppose that you go and you can have essentially only reversible um, um, uh, transformations, okay, of with the ds equals zero, s equals constant, then again, the uh, the spontaneous direction towards the towards which the system will evolve is a minimum of, of potential energy. You see, it's it's a minimum. The potential energy, sorry, the internal energy, uh, not potential energy, the internal energy will increase this way, okay? So it's a minimum. So these are the two essentially um, basic fundamental um, principles that you have to fulfill. Let's say that we're going to concentrate on this one um, most of the time, so for the isolated system, okay, for which the internal energy is always constant, we're looking for the maximum of entropy. That is our equilibrium point, okay? So really what we're trying to do, and we'll do it later, is find this function here, find this surface here uh, for the particular um, the particular thermodynamic system that we have to deal with. For example, the perfect gas, a perfect gas, okay? 
Now, let me go back. You probably have seen this, so uh, some of you may have not have seen it. Uh, let me go back to the internet site, right? Because, so can you see the page? See, see. Okay. Yes. So this is a nice internet site because um, not only it explains what entropy really means, okay, but it really uses some of the tools of the postulational approach. I don't know if you've noticed. So one of the basic examples he does is to take an isolated composite system. I don't know if you've if you recognize this as such. So it has two parts. These are the two subsystems. They're isolate. I mean, they're at this point you have you 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 have a, a wall between the two. And and suppose that this is isolated, so it doesn't exchange anything with the surrounding, absolutely nothing. Okay. And you have uh, an adiabatic wall. Okay, suppose here between the two. And what you're doing is you're giving energy only to the upper part, to the upper system. These are the famous sheep. You can think of them as packet of energy. The different green patches are the atoms. Okay, so in effect, we have overall six atoms, three in the top part, three in the bottom part, and six packets of energy. And we are only giving the energy to the upper part. The idea is now to release the internal constraint, okay? By letting now these uh, atoms be exchanged between the two subsystems, okay? You essentially remove the adiabaticity constraint so that you let uh, the flow of heat from one to, uh, to the other. The idea is what happens, okay? <clears throat> so, Let's restart. Well, because there is really no preferential configuration, is there? Uh, you can randomly, okay, move around these packets of energy, these sheep that can uh, are free to move, right? Because you've opened the gates here between the two subsystems. And so all I'm doing now on the right, I am counting, essentially, all the different configurations, okay? Now, these configurations are indicated with a number, um, and this number indicates the number of sheep on the top farm. So essentially, I'm just, I devised a way to classify, okay, my, my configurations. So number six says all of the sheep stay in the top part. So the, the, the hot subsystem stays hot. And Zero means that all of the sheep have gone to the, to the cold, okay? <clears throat> now this has become cold and this has become hot. And then there is a, a series of in-between configurations. Now, if I make it really fast, actually super fast, you see that what happens uh, is the following. Without the system not knowing anything about where, to, where the system should go, because the system really is shuffling around the, sh the, the packets of energy in configurations that each have essentially um, instantaneous configurations that ha each have the same probability. You see that the, config the number of ways in which you can have three at the top and three at the bottom is really much more probable than the other, okay? There's more ways, in other words, that I can um, place three packets of energy at the top and three packets of energy at the bottom, okay? And look, look how well behaved this thing is by just using six packets of energy and six atoms. Now, of course, as you know, we have much more than that. So if I count the number of configurations, there's a hundred ways which corresponds to 21.6% chance in which I can arrange the packets of energy so that three go at the top and three go at the bottom. Now, we're not surprised about this, right? Because we, that's what we expected. The hot and the cold tell, tend to be uniform and the energy tends to be spread out equally on the two subsystems. It would be much more surprising if, for example, all of the six uh, 
packets had gone to the cold side. There was only 6.1% that this happened. Indeed, there was a 6.1% that the, the, the whole six packets stayed at the top. So you see, if we consider entropy as being a measure, okay, uh, of the number of configurations, there is 462 configurations overall, overall, okay? But of these 462, 100 of those, okay, 100 of those imply that the energy is spread out, okay? And so if this is, um, we consider this as being a measure of entropy, well, then entropy has increased because it started from essentially a situation where you only have 28 configurations to a situation where you have 100, which is far more probable. So you see that by just defining entropy as a measure of the number of configurations, obviously, um, we're, we're essentially naturally, spontaneously, just because of a probabilistic, okay, underlying um, phenomenon, okay, we're tending towards uh, the configuration that is simply more probable, okay? Um, so again, this is a low entropy configuration where the energy is concentrated. So you may think of this as being, again, you know, situation that we had at the Big Bang, for example, the beginning of the universe. Um, generally speaking, you also have these configurations um, when you're trying to extract useful work or useful energy, okay, in a heat engine, okay? You have a hot part and a cold part. You never have situations like these, okay? So essentially, <clears throat> an engine of some sort will be an engine that keeps the entropy low psychically so that I can extract energy by simply the movement of heat from one place to another. This is the situation, the final situation where everything is spread out. There's a hundred ways in which I can do this. By a hundred ways, I mean, you can put this here, you can put this over here, you can concentrate on one at the same time, you can do this, you can do that. And overall is about a hundred ways. There's much less ways in which you can do this. Okay. So again, um, if we, and then, we're going to stop here. If, um, <clears throat> well, I don't know why this is uh, like this, but um, I should probably reload it. <clears throat> oh, here it is. So this, we start from here. Now, clearly we have far more than six packets of energy and six atoms, right? So really the, distribution of uh, <clears throat> of um, is, is of, of, of packets of energy and, and of, of um, per, um, missed the word now configurations is much much higher it turns out that if you increase the number of packets of energy and you increase the number of atoms uh, among which you have you can distribute them you see what happens this um, situation where you have maximum entropy here is really sharper and sharper. So essentially, more atoms and more energy means that it's far more probable that you'll end up in a high um, entropy configuration, okay? Because the other configurations are so unlikely, okay, that it's essentially impossible that they are ever achieved. Okay, so if I, if I go to, and this is only 40, okay, 40 or 50. Look at the numbers here. They're really unbelievable, okay? I mean, we have four, I mean, these configurations here are very, extremely improbable, and these are incredibly probable, okay? So essentially, these point to the fact that all the energy is spread out spread out in the in the two subsystems okay 
So the arrow of time, essentially what it does is it um, evolves towards situations where entropy is maximized. The number of configurations uh, is, high, is highest, okay? <clears throat> and this is always, invariably, a situation where you have packets of energy spread out. This is why uh, people call it disorder, okay? <clears throat> as opposed to these configurations here at the, at the, um, the tails okay, of, this, of this PDF, so to speak, which are uh, extremely improbable, and these are the ordered states. Okay? Also, the fact that as you increase or decrease the number of, um, of packets of energy, you're actually increasing the internal energy, and you see how incredibly fast the entropy is actually increasing because look at these numbers here, okay? You simply have more energy to be spread around each, to be distributed around uh, atoms, okay? So this is very interesting, um, I think, uh, um, the explanation, okay, of what um, we mean by entropy, okay? I hope that was useful um, for some of you. Okay, let's, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. The fact that I have to re-record <laughs> my lesson, if, if you can't hear me, it scares me terribly. So. Um, okay, let's see what else we can, we can say. Okay. Now, let's start writing some mathematical concepts here. So, we've said that... Uh, so we're going back now. We sort of know what entropy is, even though it's not necessary for uh, the sake of the postulational approach to actually have the statistical interpretation. Okay? What's really important is now we've translated essentially the problem of finding the equilibrium point to the problem of essentially finding the fundamental equation, either in terms of u or in terms of s. Now, the first thing uh, that we can write down, okay, is the differential of the fundamental equation. Why do we do that? Because really the, fun the differential of the fundamental equation will tell us um, how to study processes, right, from one equilibrium to the other. If we move from a state of internal energy U to a state of internal energy, for example, U plus DU, I have undergone an equilibrium process, a quasi-static equilibrium process, okay? <clears throat> so if I write down the perfect differential for du, which is a function of s, v, and n, I'll write it simply this way. It, it will have essentially three contributions. du by ds, keeping volume and, and moles constant by ds, plus du by dv, keeping the entropy and the moles constant by dv, which is the volume, Plus, now clearly here I have to have a sum on all the species because I have k uh, individual chemical species. And for each one, I will take the derivative du by dni, okay, with respect to the number of moles of species i, where I keep everything else constant. Not only the, the entropy, the volume, but also all of the other species constant. All of them but one, species i. So I will now multiply by the variation d and i of species i, and so on for the, for the rest. This is how you write, essentially, the differential of the fundamental equation, okay? So we're actually uh, talking about um, <clears throat> differential, let's say, movements along the manifold. Okay, that we, that we saw before. Um, each of those, let's say three, let's call them, let's call these three components, okay? These are more than three, but overall it's, it's, it's one component, um, have a physical meaning. Think about it. So let's, let's look at this. We, we can call this, in fact, the, the variation du, okay? When you keep the volume and the composition constant. Now, clearly, if we keep the volume constant, well, then internal energy cannot 
change in virtue of work being done in the system, right? Because the volume is constant, okay? So there is no work. There is no chemical energy, so to speak, because, you know, the, the composition is constant, okay? So you can't have, like, for example, a combustion reaction where you have uh, products, uh, reactants turning into products. So really what this is, it's heat, isn't it? This is the only thing that it can be is really uh, heat exchanged to and from uh, the surrounding. We're giving or extracting heat from um, the surrounding, okay? Through walls that are not adiabatic, obviously, but diathermal, okay? Now, <clears throat> by definition, okay, now, I will um, define a quantity here, and you recognize why in a second, du by ds, this derivative here, when I keep the volume and the number of moles constant, really is by definition the temperature. So this quantity here is in fact TDS, which we know being dQ, right? The heat exchange, okay? This is where we're starting to introduce <clears throat> essentially equations of state. And I'll, I'll be more specific later on. Things that will really characterize the specific system that we're dealing with. Now, um, in particular for temperature, there are a few extra postulates that we need to introduce. I don't want to complicate things any further. These are pretty straightforward and obvious, so I didn't write it uh, explicitly, but there is the fact that, um, well, postulate three, we have, we have um, uh, defined it later, um, before. Remember when we said that um, um, du by ds must be bigger than zero, meaning that s is a growing function, monotonically growing function of u. We just said as we increase the number, the number of, um, is there someone trying to get in? The number of, um, of packets of energy, entropy increases, right? Now this simply means, okay, that the temperature, because we have defined this as the temperature, okay, is always positive, okay, which is which makes uh, sense, right? Um, <clears throat> in fact, there is another postulate that we need to introduce because we need to set the zero temperature point, and this is where essentially du by ds, keeping v and n. Uh, reaches zero, zero. So it's essentially a point where the entropy is so small that it's really zero, okay? And you have to expect that to be reached when you reach absolute zero, right? Uh, zero Kelvin. Now, again, have you ever thought why zero Kelvin is really minus 273.15? Well, this is really one of the very early um, conclusions by Lord Kelvin. That's why we called him Kelvin, because he figured this out for the first time. Now, what he did was, well, at the time, the equation of state for, real, for uh, ideal gases was no. Okay? In fact, I can, <clears throat> let's see if I can write something here with the pen. <clears throat> I hope you can see. Tell me if you can't, huh? Si, 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 Okay, so um, if you take, for example, the um, ideal gas, we haven't defined it yet, but of course you you know that the ideal gas law is essentially the sum of three laws, you know, Charles Boyle's and Avogadro's law. You put them together, you have something like P. Oops. PV, I, I have to I have to learn how to write here, is equal to the number of moles times the constant times the temperature. We can rewrite this as essentially PV, the mass of your substance divided by uh, the molecular um, 
we can, we can write it with a fancy M, molecular uh, mass, okay, grams per unit moles, um, times the universal gas constant. This is the same for everyone, for every gas, okay, times uh, T. So if you think about it, if you, if you graph it, if you have a graph, so now we will do our little experiment, okay, and uh, you have the pressures here, and you have the temperatures here. Suppose I take <clears throat> different gases, okay? And I take the same volume. So this, this volume here stays the same. The mass stays the same, okay? Well, you see that essentially the relationship between P and T is a linear one, okay? And the slope changes because of the molecular weight. So I can now, for example, in, in this container, closed container of volume V, where I put the mass M of several gases, okay, one at a time, I can do an experiment and I can sort of monitor for different temperatures the pressures that my manometer measures, okay? And I can sort of draw a nice line here, okay? And then I can do the same for another gas, okay? Something like this. And then I can sort of put a line of best fit, okay? So these are my experimental points. And what Laura Kelvin did was, okay, let's just extrapolate this to zero, zero pascals, okay? Well, I have a point here, that point read minus 273.15 Kelvin, uh, sorry, at Celsius. So that was defined as the zero Kelvin. You couldn't go any further than that, okay? <clears throat> so that's, a, that's the point where essentially you have a situation um, where du by ds is equal to zero. The temperature is, is zero, okay? And, and the entropy at this point essentially vanishes. You cannot have negative pressure. I don't understand why. Okay, it's just people trying to get in. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So again, let's go back to our differential. Okay, so the ways in which uh, we can change internal energy is through heat. Obviously, the second bit, you probably guessed what it is. It has to be work, right? Because <clears throat> essentially, it is, um, it, it underlines the fact that uh, this is the change of internal energy when you keep the entropy constant. So in some sense, the heat constant um, and the number of moles, okay? So there is no exchange of heat. There's no exchange of or variation in the composition. There is a change of volume, okay, here, change of volume. And so du by dv, by definition, is clearly minus the pressure, okay? And that's what we define as minus being minus the pressure. So this is the energy change that occurs through mobile walls, through pistons. We're changing the volume, okay, without uh, exchanging heat. We're not changing the composition. So this is where, and the minus sign, obviously, <clears throat> is due to the fact that we are multiplying by dV. So if I compress, dV is negative, but I'm adding work to the system, right? So PdV must be positive. So it's minus PdV, okay? <clears throat> now, um, the third contribution, okay, let's go back here, is what? Is the change, okay, of internal energy of the system when I don't exchange any heat, so the entropy is constant, I don't change the volume, so I don't exchange work, but I change the composition of the system. So it seems that I can change the internal energy by changing the composition of the system, okay? 
And that is going to be very important in chemical reactions, okay? And in the final point that we want to reach, which is how to calculate the chemical equilibrium of a system. So this is really <clears throat> chemical energy, okay? So it's the energy that we associate um, when we add, okay, a particular, for example, uh, substance or the unit, for example, mass of a substance, and, I, and we change the composition, okay? Um, <clears throat> when you say we add, you can also do this at constant mass. So what happens is, for example, think of a chemical reaction. We're going to define those things rigorously later on, but a chemical reaction is really a, a, a kind of a machinery that really can change, uh, or a mechanism that can change uh, one species to another. So for example, combustion, you're converting reactants into products, okay? And the products, gradually appear. So you're adding these products to the system, okay? So how do we measure this chemical energy of the unit mass or the unit mole of, um, of a species? Well, we, me we measure it through something called the chemical potential, okay? Essentially, what the chemical potential is, is <clears throat> the increase of internal energy in this particular definition at constant well, with no exchange of heat, no exchange, or no variations of volume, and no variation of all of the other species. Bear this in mind. Um, by just adding the unit mole of species I. So there is one chemical potential associated to each of those chemical species, okay? And in some sense, if before we were exchanging heat through diathermal walls, or work through mobile walls. Now you can think of, in some sense, exchanging mass, okay, through permeable walls, okay. If you want to really have a picture of what's going on, okay. So um, <clears throat> simply by these de three definitions, temperature, pressure, and chemical potential, I can rewrite my. Um, here it is my uh, differential, uh, fundamental equation in differential form, okay? By getting rid of all the, those ugly derivatives, I can write down du equals TDS, which is the heat, minus PdV, the work, and the chemical energy, which is the sum of mu i, d, and i. Because everything is invertible, I can also rewrite this in terms of uh, <clears throat> a differential of the entropy, so it's an entropy-based differential form of the fundamental equation. All I have to do is you know, divide by T, so it's one over T du minus P over T dV minus the sum of mu I over T dNi. I've just inverted this one, okay? Um, so what do we do with these uh, differential forms? <clears throat> well, Again, let me just stress that what, what we want to do is, remember, we want to um, establish the fundamental equations, okay? U of S, V, and N, okay? Now, we've seen that there are some definitions that we can, uh, that we can, uh, make, okay, that define temperature, pressure, and chemical potential. These definitions we call equations of state, okay? These are really um, relations that specialize our thermodynamic system, okay? That essentially tell us, okay, look, you're dealing with a perfect gas, okay? And not like some piece of metal, for example, or some cryogenic fluid, okay? Uh, you're really dealing with a set of, uh, for example, um, matter or a piece of matter that is composed of molecules that are pretty much uh, 
spread apart, okay? Uh, they don't interact. Um, and um, so that is the model of, um, uh, so for example, the hard, hard sphere model or something like that. So it's, it's, it's the simplest model of a gas, let's say, okay? How do I express, <clears throat> for example, temperature, pressure, and chemical potential as a function of my extensive parameters? Okay. The fact that uh, Tp and mu are intensive, okay, is because we are dividing two extensive quantities all the time. So extensive divided by extensive gives me intensive, okay, all the time. So by definition, they're all intensive. Now, let me give you a more um, <clears throat> general definition of intensive and extensive quantities, because this is how we are going to um, express the fundamental equation, okay? Um, <clears throat> so let me just get my, again, my um, blackboard here. Wait a minute, I have to take, so, give me five seconds because I, I completely forgot how to use this. <clears throat> oh, clear cams. Okay. So if you remember, we had defined uh, an extensive, okay, <clears throat> um, function, uh, a function that, that has essentially this, pro this property, okay? Suppose that I have a function f, uh, well, I'll, I'll write it here, f of x, y. I'm not specifying anything about x and y. But if I take lambda times x and lambda times y, if f is an extensive quantity, then in general, I can write down lambda times f of x and y, okay? So if I take lambda times x and lambda times y, so I take lambda times this, the sort of the constituent subsystems, I can, I can say that the entropy, the volume, everything is multiplied by lambda. In fact, if I generalize this, okay, I can talk about a homogeneous function of order n, <clears throat> okay? A homogeneous function of order n, and so, F is extensive when n is equal to 1, okay? And in fact, is intensive when n is equal to 0, right? Because clearly if n is equal to 0, however I multiply my my x and y's, I always end up with, with f. So essentially, if f is the temperature, if I take lambda times my system, okay, so twice or three times my, 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 um, the quantity of my gas, for example, at the same temperature, you're always going to have the same temperature. You're not going to have lambda times the temperature, obviously. Okay? So this is essentially my definition. Now, there's a very, very nice... Um, um, uh, theorem, Euler theorem, Euler pops up everywhere, um, for a theorem, for um, n equals 1, okay? <clears throat> so for extensive functions. Now, I will write it, and then I'll, if you want, I can prove it. So if I have an extensive function, okay, an homogeneous first-order function, okay, 
um, for example, x1 of, 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 these, of these variables, okay? I can express this as the sum of the differentials df by dxi times xi, okay? <clears throat> Which is pretty handy. Okay, um, think of, oh, if you want to improve this, but um, so if F again is extensive, there is a way of writing it, which is very, which is straightforward. I just sum on all the, um, the independent variables, okay? And I take the differential on the independent variable and then multiply by the independent variable. So for example, <clears throat> think how useful this is if we want to find our fundamental equation, which is u of s, v, and n, right? Well, we know that u is, let me see if I can, Sooner or later, I'm going to write a little better. Uh, I have to get used to this because it's been a while. You need some time to get adjusted to these uh, blackboard every time. So remember, our, our problem was to find um, the fundamental equation, right? Now, we know that u is extensive, right? So it's exactly the same properties of f. So it's a homogeneous first order function. And so, really, we can express u as, following this, as, well, we take the first differential, so it's du by ds, okay, at constant v and n, okay, and then we multiply by the same variable that we've differentiated by, so by times s, okay, plus, <clears throat> Uh, dv, sorry, du by dv. Again, calculated at uh, constant uh, entropy and n, okay? Times what? Times v plus uh, the sum, oops, <clears throat> of all the derivatives du by d and i. Oops, d and i times n i, okay? Where these are blah, 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 you know, at constant s, constant v, and all the others constant j, which is not equal to i, okay? So now we have a way of actually starting to express um, our... Um, fundamental equation. You may think, well, but wait a minute, how, who's going to give me these? Okay. Well, but we've defined these, haven't we? We've just defined them. This is what? Well, <clears throat> this is essentially temperature, which is a function of, again, S, V, and N. Okay, so this is really temperature. So if I have a way of expressing the intensive quantity temperature as a function of S, V, and N, really my, my problem is pretty much solved. I call this an equation of state. Equations of state, E or S, equations of state, let's say equation of state number one, is a function that relates essentially intensive and extensive quantities, okay? And so if, it can, if I can write it, for example, for a perfect gas, and I for, certainly know how to write it for a perfect gas, um, then um, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go because I can substitute it here, okay? And I can start writing my fundamental equation. If I know my explicit form of the fundamental equation, I know how to find an equilibrium point, okay? So, well, this is minus P, 
again of S, V, and N. Okay, equation of state number two. Okay, and this is um, mu, mu i of S, V, and N. And this is equation of state number three to essentially two plus k, if, if k is the number of, <clears throat> okay? So I hope that it's clear now that I will be able to, maybe let me go back to, <clears throat> I hope you've finished writing. I just want to go back to the slides. Um, so if I have, <clears throat> one, two, and k, okay, so k plus two equations of state, these functions here, all I have to do is substitute them in the Euler form. You see, I'm using the Euler theorem. And, um, and I have expressed u, okay? So given the fundamental equation, we can now find the equilibrium point of the system. Okay, because I know the fundamental equation u of s, v, and n. Okay, let me, um, if you want, and you don't believe Euler's theorem, I can, I can prove it to you. I, I'm a little slow. Here it is. Um, so, um, So we want to prove this, okay? We want to prove that f of x1, x2, x3 is equal to this, okay? So the definition of, um, of um, homogeneous first order function, as we said, is f of lambda x and lambda y is equal to lambda, okay, to the n, well, this is n equals one, remember? Write it here. Um, f of x of n, okay? Sorry, f of x and y, sorry. Um, to prove it, you just substitute x prime as lambda x, y prime as lambda y, okay? <clears throat> and then we take the right-hand side, okay? And we take the differential or the derivative rather <clears throat> with respect to lambda. Okay, so we're just we're just taking the derivative of the the right hand side and the left hand side. So this is lambda f of x and y, and of the left hand side, we're taking the derivative, and then we're substituting f of x prime and y prime, okay? <clears throat> so this is easy because we're differentiating with respect to lambda, so this is n, lambda n minus one, okay? f of x and y. Then I will substitute the n equals one later on. Now here, um, we just do a chain rule, so we go from, we, we, we write down df by dx prime, and then dx prime by d lambda, and df by dy prime, dy prime by d lambda, okay? <clears throat> and this is equal to <clears throat> df by dx prime, well, and this dx prime by d lambda is simply x, right? And df by dy prime, y prime, okay, uh, times y. dy prime by d lambda is, here is y. And then we, we've done because if when n equals one, <clears throat> clearly 
x prime is equal to y, sorry, to x. And y prime is equal to y, okay? And so substituting n equals one, you have essentially f of x and y is equal to df dx times x plus df dy times y, okay? So in general, it's the sum of df dx times dxi times xi, which is exactly what we wanted to prove, okay? So in particular, this holds for, um, this holds for uh, the internal energy, obviously, okay? Um, here. In fact, uh, it also holds for the entropy. Let me write it here. <clears throat> because we can write now the entropy, which is again, homogeneous first order function. So we can write down through Euler's theorem, um, ds by du, because remember S is a function of u, v, and n. ds by du times u plus ds by dv times times v, and then the sum of um, ds by dn i uh, times n i, okay? And again, these are equations of state in terms of entropy. So this is one over t, okay? This is, uh, what is it? P over t over, over t, and this is mu i over t, okay? <clears throat> now, how do we express one over t, p over t, mu i over t, okay? This is where you really have to look at your particular system, thermodynamic system, and come up with at least three equations of state, okay? I mean, not three. Uh, three kinds of equation state, one, two, and then here you have K, so K over two. But suppose we have simply a one, um, one species, so I don't have a multi-species, multi-component system, okay? I, um, I will do experiments, for example, uh, or come up with some fancy molecular dynamics uh, simulation or theory or, or uh, statistical mechanics theory and derive uh, these um, equations of state, okay? For example, um, let's look at the equations of state uh, for an ideal gas, okay? I will not at all prove any of this the first and the second one you probably know from your studies, okay? Well, we know that an ideal gas, uh, for an ideal gas, we have the um, ideal gas law, right? Which is one of the equations of state that you can write down for, a, for, an, for an ideal gas law. Now you see how important the, the, the equation of state is. Its function, is to be substituted in, um, for example, this term here, okay, P over T, you see, uh, in order to um, fill in <coughs> and complete the fundamental equation, okay? So uh, this is from Boyle's law, Gaylo Sachs and Avogadro's law. You put them all together, you have very, very useful, incredibly useful equation. Um, between pressure, temperature, and um, and um, and volume. Okay, this there there is a there is obviously a <clears throat> mistake here. Uh, now the second equation is the thermal equation of state, where essentially we are um, 
for a monatomic gas, we're deriving the internal energy, okay, in terms of temperature. So essentially it's three halves of NRT is the internal energy, okay? Uh, for the chemical potential, well, it gets a little more complicated. Again, it's beyond the scope of this course, but you can use, for example, the gibbs duheim uh, relation, which is this complex thing, which relates essentially <clears throat> temperature, chemical potential to things like uh, internal energy, specific internal energy and specific volume. Okay. So <clears throat> you take all these three and you put them here. What I would like to convey is that now we have essentially closed our problem. So you start from a theory, you start from postulates, okay? Um, you have a minimum set of postulates. You determine the problem as being a problem where essentially I remove the internal constraint of a system, of a composite isolated system, for example. And I say, okay, the equilibrium point, the spontaneous equilibrium point will be reached when you maximize the entropy. At this point, my problem reduces to finding the entropy as a fundamental equation. So I use my Euler's theorem for extensive uh, quantities. And then I realize that um, I will have these um, differentials, okay, to be expressed, okay? I, need, I have the problem of expressing these differentials. And I do that using equations of state. And who tells me the equation of state? Well, some very good scientist who experimentally uh, or through some other means have devised a way in which we can relate essentially uh, field variables, which are intensive variables to uh, extensive variables, okay? And uh, I substitute them here. This is a very, very um, simple case of the ideal gas, and I, I, I put it here. Now, clearly, again, I've only scratched the surface. As you can see, I haven't specified, um, I haven't gone into too much detail because my interest here at this point is to give you the outline of this process. But I hope you see the simplicity now of, of the thermodynamics, okay? It's, uh, um, it's not just bits and pieces in the inductive uh, uh, it's a, it, it approach. It's really a complete self-contained theory with, um, with a deductive approach based on the foundation of these um, postulates, okay? So we have essentially reached the solution, the final solution, which is the achievement, the, the possibility of writing down our fundamental equation, okay? Once we have it written down, then it's a mathematical problem of finding the maximum of this, um, of this um, function. Now, let's go further with the theory, okay? <clears throat> now, again, let's go back, for example, to the energy-based, internal energy-based, okay? Uh, fundamental uh, equation. We wrote it in terms of uh, Euler's theorem, S, V, and N, with these um, um, derivatives, which represent the equation of state. Equation of state number one, equation of state number two, and equation of state kind of equation of state number three. I need K of those, okay? Now, remember this, which is an important aspect, <clears throat> okay? I wanna go back to my, my drawing board here a second, because <clears throat> if you remember, we had derived two conditions of equilibrium, okay? Remember point A? In our, in our um, little drawing of the manifold of constrained equilibrium points, okay? There are two possibilities. <clears throat> if the system is isolated, okay, then the internal energy is constant. So we have to live on this constant, on, on this flat plane, the U equals constant plane, and then we can apply what? 
the equilibrium point is essentially the maximum of entropy, okay, at constant um, internal energy. If we invert, remember the uh, fundamental equation, we have another uh, condition for something called isentropic system. I don't really know what an isentropic system is, but again, a system for which the entropy can, can be uh, kept constant, okay? Then if we can uh, keep the entropy constant, um, the equilibrium point will be found as, sorry, erase this, as the minimum, okay, of internal energy. U at S equals constant, okay? Now, let me ask you, again, think of the overall problem in combustion, okay? We want to find uh, the condition of equilibrium when we react hydrogen and oxygen, okay? So our thermodynamic system is a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, maybe um, at constant pressure and temperature, for example, or maybe the temperature is not constant because uh, I, I make the, the system adiabatic, okay? I can keep the temperature constant, obviously, by extracting the heat of reaction and keep everything constant. Uh, but in any case, I can't really relate to any of, of these two cases because, uh, well, is it an isolated system? Is it an isentropic system? Really, what I would like it to be is, for example, a constant pressure system. So what I would like to do here is <clears throat> essentially this. I would like to derive a set of further conditions, not just these two, okay? Conditions of equilibrium, okay? Which are useful in different situations. When I keep the temperature constant, when I keep the composition constant, when I keep both the pressure and temperature constant, what are the equivalent uh, conditions of equilibrium? This is my, my question. I hope that's clear. You can you can hear me, right? Well, every now and then I'm checking on you because yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. thank you. So I hope that's clear uh, in terms of what I just said. Okay. Um, I'm developing this sort of new thermostatics or thermodynamics, uh, equilibrium thermodynamics, but I'd like it to make, have it to, to be also useful. So remember that when I, especially in, in combustion, when we're dealing with uh, chemical reactions, okay? You know, a reactive system is still a thermodynamic system, um, but it's a system that is usually in a laboratory, uh, when I react hydrogen and oxygen, for example, at uh, atmospheric, atmospheric pressure, I do this by keeping the pressure constant. I'm not keeping the entropy constant, okay? Which is a very strange thing to do. I could also not be keeping the internal energy constant by letting, um, you know, maybe work be done or heat be released to the outside. So I'd like to specialize um, my, my system. And in order to do that, the idea is to derive absolutely equivalent um, forms of the fundamental equation by introducing uh, what are um, called thermodynamic potentials, okay? Now, this is the source of all of the confusion of thermodynamics. What are thermodynamic potentials? Enthalpy is a thermodynamic potential. Gibbs energy is a thermodynamic potential. Helmholtz free energy is all these things that in classical thermodynamics are given to you and, and as a sort of a fact, okay? This is enthalpy, this is how you write it. They're not really explained fully, 
okay? And it's the source of, you know, the, the major source of confusion um, and, and compl apparent complexity in thermodynamics. In this situation here, I will show you that really the definition of these potentials, equivalent forms of the fundamental equation, are in fact nothing else but transforms or transformations of the fundamental equation into completely equivalent forms, okay? And we transform this through something that is really easy to understand, which is the Legendre transform, okay? That's what we do. We, we take a Legendre transform of the fundamental equation, okay? I think we can directly go to the Legendre transform without looking at this. I'm going to give you these slides anyway, so you can also not take notes. So for simplicity, imagine I forget about volume and number of moles, okay? To, to, make it, to make the notation simpler. So this is my fundamental equation in terms of internal energy as a function of entropy, very good, U of S. Okay, now, I'm not really interested in U of S, I need some alternative forms, okay? So I will take what is called a Legendre transform, okay? Now, the fancy word really is far simpler than it seems. Suppose, okay, the U of S is a function, okay? I, I look at my plane, U and S plane, okay? I can draw it, right? Now, there is a, some of you may immediately recognize that there is a mistake here because the entropy is a monotonically <laughs> growing function of U. So you cannot go down, okay? So it needs to go up, but this is a mistake so suppose this is monotonically growing function, okay? So the, um, the function u of s, okay, is characterized by essentially the coordinates u and s, points on the, on the curve, right? Now, is there an equivalent way of representing this curve, u of s, uh, other than the coordinates u and s? Well, yes, there is. Suppose that I have a tangent line, okay, in the point US, and a completely equivalent way of characterizing this point, for example, is if I take the intercept, the point where this line, this tangent line, meets the y-axis, which I call psi, and then, the slope of the tangent curve. So the tangent curve has this equation, u equals psi plus du by ds, s. So if someone gives me psi and du by ds, okay, I will take my psi, okay, I will draw a line here of slope du by ds, and this will intercept in the point us. So whether I give you U and S, the, the coordinate, or whether I give you these two numbers, it's exactly the same. I hope you agree, okay? So the Legendre transform, okay, of U, of S, of the um, fundamental equation, is really nothing else but Psi, the intercept Psi, because this was the um, the equation of the tangent curve, which we expressed as u minus u by ds times s. Okay? Pretty straightforward. So now, instead of having a function u of s, I have essentially a function of psi and du by ds. Okay? Totally equivalent. So every single point now can be described by the tangent curve at that point and the intercept, okay? This is a way of modifying the function, u into something else, which is totally equivalent, okay? Now, let's see if, um, 
if I can, so I hope this is clear. It's nothing special, okay? Really nothing special. It's, it's, it's sort of a, a geometric transformation, nothing more, okay? I'm representing, instead of the set of points in a curve, I'm representing the envelope, okay, of tangent curves, of tangent lines, essentially. But it's, it's exactly the same, okay? Um, <clears throat> So let's see what we have next. So we have 10 minutes left. Well, I, I, I probably will, will, um, will write it because these are a little bit confusing if I remember correctly. Um, <clears throat> very good. So let's take some Legendre transforms, okay? <clears throat> of my fundamental equation u, s, v, and n, okay? <clears throat> so, um, suppose, again, let me rewrite it. I have my fundamental equation in this form, okay? I want to take the Legendre transform of this, okay? So suppose I'm taking, for example, psi the Legendre transform, which in this particular case, let me write it. I, let me, I don't want to use psi all the time. So let me take, for example, the letter F, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, again, let me go back to our, um, to our slides. Okay, and remember now psi is a function of du by ds, okay? So <clears throat> f is a function of du by ds, and then, so by the derivative of s, sorry, of du by ds, so I'm replacing essentially this part here with du by ds, and I'm leaving the other two Okay, variables, okay? <clears throat> in some sense, if you think about it, uh, this is an incomplete um, um, fundamental equation simply because, well, these three things, okay, um, are essentially taken from the, um, equations of state, but one of the equations of state remains essentially undetermined in differential form. Well, I can't really use this, um, this fundamental equation because I would have to take the integral of this, and so it would be essentially un un undetermined to a constant or to a constant function or something, okay? <clears throat> so one of the equations of states remains in differential form, okay? But all I'm doing exactly, I'm just taking the, the, the Legendre transform of, of this, to make things easier. So take now the equation of the slope of the uh, tangent line. This was what? U minus du by ds times s, okay? This is the, how you write down and define f. So f is really u minus. Now, du by ds, remember what it was? Du by ds is the temperature. So t, temperature times s, okay? So I've taken the Legendre transform of u, okay? by essentially expressing, um, <clears throat> by leaving du by ds in differential form, okay? And I get f equals u minus ts. This is nothing else but Helmholtz potential.
okay? One of the many um, thermodynamic potentials that I can define, okay? The definition, straightforward, okay? From taking the Legendre transform of this, okay? I can take another one, look. Let's see if it's clearer here. <clears throat> um, for example, again, let's start from um, our fundamental equation. And suppose now I'm taking the Legendre transform, I'm calling it H, okay, this crease. And I want it as a function of, for example, S, okay, this stays. But uh, now I'm, have, I'm keeping the differential form here, du by dv, and I'm keeping it okay, like this. So in fact, now we're on the plane essentially uv. So um, <clears throat> the Legendre transform, which is h, is defined now as u minus du by dv. So this is the, the tangent line times v. Remember what u, oh, sorry, what du by dv was, this is minus p, remember? By definition, so this is u plus pv. Now, some of you may remember how this is called, remember? Enthalpy, right? <clears throat> so you see how now we're not giving the definitions. This is what it's done usually in thermodynamics. Oh, what's enthalpy? Oh, it's U plus PV. Yeah, but why? Why is it U plus PV? Well, now we know why. Because it's the Legendre transform of this particular case, okay? Uh, and it is a complete, now H, you can use it exactly like you used U, okay? F and H are essentially two equivalent forms of the fundamental equation in terms of the internal energy that you can use, uh, and uh, wait, wait, that are uh, better to use, more suited to be used in different conditions. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll tell you, for example, why um, in these last three minutes. For example, let's look at enthalpy, okay? <clears throat> Which is what we're going to be using more than anything else. So, um, well, in fact, Gibbs energy is what we're going to be using. So uh, let me just, I don't have time to define the Gibbs energy. I'll define it tomorrow. But um, let's see in what situation, what conditions it, we, we can use the enthalpy. Right? So let's take the differential form, okay, using this. So this is du plus PdV plus VdP, right? <clears throat> now, if I uh, substitute for du its own expression, remember, it was TdS minus PdV Okay, um, <clears throat> plus the sum of mu i d and i, okay? And then I'll just have to write down, so this is, this is du, okay? And then I re-add these two terms, pdv plus vdp, okay? Oops, yeah. So PDV goes, okay? <clears throat> so you see DH is essentially TDS plus VDP plus the sum of mu i <clears throat> DNI. So simply put, <clears throat> what does DH represent? It represents, for example, okay? The heat exchanged at constant pressure here, so this goes to zero, and constant composition. So if I keep the composition constant 
and um, the pressure constant, this represents the heat exchange, okay? Now you'll see that, this we need a little bit more time, that for constant pressure systems, okay, the minimum of internal energy can be um, translated in a condition for the enthalpy. So for particular systems that are constant pressure, okay, the enthalpy is essentially the right um, chemical potentials to use. Okay, Helmholtz potential, we're almost never going to be using it. Tomorrow I'm going to derive the Gibbs energy and you'll see that the Gibbs energy is the best possible choice for as a chemical potential to be used in constant pressure and constant temperature um, systems, okay? It's a little bit more elaborate than this, but I hope that, you see, like in, in two lectures, we really reconstructed the whole sort of um, uh, complexity of, of thermodynamics really based on these uh, on these postulates okay so uh, I don't have time to to define anything else uh, I'll do this um, next time uh, I can I'll put these slides up so for you to to go back let me just stop the recording